Welcome. This is episode six of TR Live. Uh, this is our final show for 2018. Uh, thank you for all those who have joined us so far uh, in our first uh, venture into some new forms of media. And hopefully we'll continue this and other little new projects on into 2019. Uh, I'm your host, Brent. And tonight I've got the usual panel, Jeff Groom. Good evening. John. Hey, guys. And Mr. William S. Lind. Uh, Bill, you said you had you were drinking something a little bit different tonight. Tell us about that. We, I just opened, Johnny is finishing our good port, and I have opened a bottle of sack, which gives me the vague feeling that we should be toasting Queen Elizabeth the uh, first and success to the Queen's galleons against the Dons, because this is uh, sack is one of those wonderful wines you hear referenced. Uh, when you get back to the real good old days. This is from uh, a very interesting town, uh, which all conservatives will love. It is Madison, Indiana, about an hour from Cincinnati on the Ohio River. It is a perfectly preserved, quite extensive pre-Civil War river town. I think it has 130 blocks on the National Register. It's really quite remarkable, most of it in a Greek revival style. And this is a little winery down there. Uh, the, the sack is good, but beyond that, the town is definitely worth a visit for anyone with an interest in history and architecture. Uh, they've got a great hotel where you can stay up on a bluff looking down over the town and the river. And it's uh, one of those places that not many people know about, but those who do are more than happy to, uh, to drink the wine and recommend the town. Cool. And <clears throat> what, say the name of that town again. Madison, Indiana. It's, okay. uh, our sack is from the Thomas Family Winery in Madison, and um, it has a wonderful color, and it's a somewhat cherry-like wine, uh, but definitely, uh, definitely takes us back to the to the good old days when uh, the phrase "heads will roll" was not necessarily a metaphor. <laughs> so, what what is sack? Is it, it it's just grape wine? Uh, it is a sherry-like wine. It's like a dry sherry. And I forget, I knew once, I can't remember now the etymology of the word sack. Uh, obviously, the wine came originally from Spain. But uh, it's the term, is the, the name of the wine has disappeared. It's closest to a dry sherry, maybe a, a fino. Uh, there's definitely, it, you definitely, when you taste it, you'll know it's in the sherry family. I'll put it that way. All right, interesting. And you will notice also that as the level of the wine goes down in the bottle, the show gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I actually, um, over the last couple of months, I I've been watching some apple cider uh, slowly ferment in my basement. So I'm waiting until the day I get to bottle that and try it out. Among the many idiocies inflicted on us by government. It's now very hard to find cider that isn't pasteurized. And of course, pasteurized cider won't ferment. Uh, I can still get some down in Amish country. And even if you're drinking it as fresh cider, leave it in the fridge for a while. It will start to uh, ferment. You'll start to get some of the bubble action. And you'll start to get a, a bit of a tang to it that makes it much more interesting. So, of course, government has to take that away from us and make us drink stuff that's, uh, that's fit only for children. <laughs> yeah that's right yeah I'm, I'm excited to try this um you know i, I think prohibition we used to be a, a cider country and then uh all the all the cider orchards got cut down as a world, result of prohibition so we don't drink hard cider uh nearly as much as we used to in this country no everybody every farm made their own that was how it worked Anyway, uh, I uh, got, we are uh, losing you quite a bit. You're 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 doing a lot of uh, breaking up. So, John, I don't know if you can change some settings or anything real quick. All right, let's see. <clears throat> Is it any better, Brent? Yeah. 
don't have the video, uh, that'll work a little better. Okay. Um, so since it's only been a couple days since we did our last show, uh, and it's still, you know, Christmas, New Year's time, there's not a whole lot news wise that's happening. So I thought ma that maybe we could just go around the room and mention a, a favorite moment or uh, a moment that we thought was particularly impactful from the last year. And we could start there and use that as a you know, starting point for conversation, unless any of you have any news items that you want to mention first. I do have a news item. And I so that Jeff is going to react to the same way I did. <clears throat> this is from the Friday, December 28th, New York Times, <clears throat> which <clears throat> quotes the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, a Marine, America's top soldier, as saying that the Taliban, quote, are not losing, unquote. Well, that's right. They're not losing because they're winning. Uh, mm -hmm. This reminded me of uh, uh, the Showa Emperor's statement to the Japanese people in 1945 announcing the surrender, where he said the war has developed in ways not necessarily to Japan's advantage. And then he goes on, according to the Times, to make one of the most mind-boggling statements I have ever heard from a nation's senior military man. I quote, speaking of the war in Afghanistan, if someone has a better idea than we have right now, which is to support the Afghans and put pressure on the terrorist groups in the region, I'm certainly open to dialogue on that, General Dunford said. 16 years into a war with uh, over a thousand Americans dead, many thousands maimed, a trillion dollars down the sewer. And this is the best formulation of strategy we can get from the nation's top soldier. I mean, he makes Keitel look like a military genius at this point. This is in the annals of military incompetence. I have to say, this is, is right up there uh, with Moltke Jr. and, uh, and Mac at the Battle of Ulm. Uh, and behold the unfortunate Mac after he lost the whole Austrian army to Napoleon. This is mind-boggling. He's saying, in effect, well, you know, if the charwoman or the egg lady or my driver or somebody has a better idea, I, I, I really like to hear it. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But the best we can come up with is putting pressure, which is to say pinpricks, on terrorist groups and somehow expecting that to result in strategic victory. Uh, even by the, it, by the low standards set by America's general officers, this is really appalling. Might be the weakest admission of incompetence I've ever read. Uh, <laughs> it's even an incompetent statement of incompetence. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so... I, as I have said repeatedly, including in columns for this website and for the American Conservative, and even General Dunford, I suspect, recognizes the strategic key to the Taliban is Pakistan. But the strategic key to Pakistan, which apparently neither the general nor anybody else in Washington has the slightest clue about, is that we have allowed, incredibly stupidly, the current Afghan government to align with India. Well, what Pakistan sees as the threat is India, and India is much stronger militarily than Pakistan. Now, Pakistan sees itself put in a two-front situation, where they have an Indian ally on one side and India on the other, and they're weaker than India. Naturally, they cannot do anything but back the Taliban. So if we want Pakistan not to be the strategic base for the Taliban, then obviously the starting point is to tell the current Afghan government, you are going to de-align from India and become a very loyal and subservient ally to Pakistan. That at least gives the Pakistanis maneuvering role and allows them, with the present they can't do it, to break with the Taliban. 
I do not understand why, with all these brilliant people in Washington, no one can see this very elemental strategic fact that it would have taken Bismarck about 30 seconds to recognize. Well, if you give us more money, we'll figure it out. Yes, that's, <laughs> uh, they, we need more people and a bigger budget. Yes, absolutely. Do you think that the policymakers are trying to use India as a foil against China? Of course they are. Uh, but Afghanistan is not relevant as a threat to China. It's very relevant as a threat to Afghanistan, or excuse me, Pakistan. So in terms of our trying to balance China with India, which by the way won't work, because India is not nearly as serious a country as China and doesn't have nearly the prospects for the future that China does as a world power. But even if we're trying to do that, Afghanistan simply is not a player in that game. But boy, it's a big player from the Pakistani perspective when Pakistan's looking at India and suddenly India's tied to the, to the current Afghan government. You know, the danger, too, is that much of India is now responsible for controlling a lot of our software because we've outsourced all of our software companies to India. So that presents another strategic interest there to preserve or at least, you know, intellectual data is the big problem we have with China. And India is also a big source of intellectual data as well. Of course, the outsourcing of all of this stuff. And, you know, there's a way, and I really wish somebody would get through to President Trump on this. There's a way to stop this outsource. And it's an export tariff. We normally think of tariffs as tariffs on imports, but historically there have been many tariffs on exports. A, a big source of revenue for the British crown for centuries was an export duty on wool, mm -hmm. yeah. being exported to the factories and looms of the low countries from England. An export duty on jobs that would be equal to the difference between what they pay the employee in India and what they pay the employee in the United States would put a very quick end to this exporting of jobs. Right, potentially. Again, yeah. here we have a historical tool that people in Washington should be aware of. And we now do have a president to whom tariff is not a dirty word. So why don't we put an export tariff on tariff on these jobs and keep the jobs here? Right. Going back to the, oh, go ahead. Going back to the question of military leadership or lack thereof, um, right. can can we really fairly place the blame on them when they don't even really know what winning looks like? They're just kind of there to manage a situation, not so much, um, you know. They're not really pushing towards an attainable goal. Uh, what what really is he supposed to be doing? I, I disagree. I think as a general, he has to have the moral courage to some point just put his foot down and say, no, not with my help. Like, when are we going to have the general officer that stands up against cultural Marxism or our failed strategy and uses their clout, uses their influence in the media for, for the good instead of attacking Trump like McChrystal? Well, they, they don't get to be general if they do stuff like that. Well, but right. at this point, though, Dunford could do that. He could just, I understand he's a very devout Catholic man. Like, why don't you just put your foot down for once and say, you know what, this is bull crap. So, I mean, yes, he, he follows orders, but it's still a volunteer military. And if you see what's wrong and you are and you still volunteer, well, then I, I really, I don't really have any pity for them in a way of like, well, what else are they supposed to do? Well, then you can just hang it up and say, I'm getting out and I'm not helping this. I mean, that's what I kind of did in a way. I'm like, well, I don't like this system. It doesn't work, and I can't change it from the inside, so I'm not going to help it. But yeah, well, Jeff, um, I think though that Brent's question has has a more specific answer. The mm -hmm. chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff is the chief military advisor to the president of the United States. He has a major role in formulating strategy. Yeah. And if this statement is an indication of the quality of the strategic advice the president is getting, I yeah. hope crystal ball and a Ouija board, because he's going to do better with those than listening to this kind of crap from his top general. Yeah. Uh, this, this suggests simply a complete absence of thought. Yeah. Or again, that's been going on for 16 years. It's not like we've gotten caught with our pants down. Right. It's, it's, it's not like suddenly Canada invaded with no warning and they're halfway to Washington and what do you do now? So the JCS chairman 
is the person the president, in the formal system at least, relies mm -hmm. on for recommendations on strategy. Yeah. I mean, do you think this might be a case of what, you know, Rumsfeld called an, you know, an unknown unknown? Do you think Dunford really just for the, for, he just really cannot, for whatever reason, think of war outside of the state-based view? I mean, are we really that, is he really that ill-read that he can't understand that we're not fighting a, you know, traditional state-on-state -state contest? It's fourth generation war. Like, it, maybe he just doesn't get that. And he still sees it through that lens, you know, the Westphalian lens. And every solution has to come through that way. So I, I don't know. That's all I can think of because the evidence is just so, you know, you know, inc incontrovertible in, in terms of what we see on the ground that if he can't see anything else, then I don't know, maybe he's just blissfully ignorant of it all. I don't know. I think that actually what we're seeing here, because this runs through the whole American system, particularly at the general officer level, is something that Clausewitz warned against, and it's something that John Boyd warned against. Every decision is made by committee consensus. Clausewitz warned about councils of war precisely for this reason, and Boyd put it best. He said that invariably, when you make a decision that way, the committee picks the worst of all possible options, uh, that it guarantees that the lowest common denominator solution, because that's how you get a consensus in a committee, is you go for the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator here is, yes, support the Afghans, part of them anyway, and put pressure on the terrorists. That's a classic committee formulation, lowest common denominator committee consensus. These generals and admirals have grown up their whole lives avoiding making decisions and taking action. They all have half a noodle loop. They observe, they orient, and then back to observing again. They never get to the decision and action part because if you do, you never make it to lieutenant colonel, much less to lieutenant general. The saddest right. part about that most people that read the New York Times are going to take this and say, yep, see, that's proof that Trump has no ideas and it's all his fault, even though this guy is the one demonstrating gross incompetence. Right, and he's the chief advisor. He's the, the, president. Yeah, he's the guy that's supposed to have the ideas. So, so it's, but I think this is systemic. I think, again, it comes back to the fact that we don't promote people in our military who make decisions and act. We promote the time servers, the cautious yes men, uh, the, the people who never cover up, color outside the lines, who never take initiative, do only what they're told. We all say, oh, we want excellence in our officers. No, we don't. We want a dependable, hardworking, predictable mediocrity. And that's what we get. And that includes our generals, because the more levels of promotion you go through, the more thorough is the process of weeding out anybody else. Funny, funny little aside, I, I, a funny news clip from a few years ago was Dunford and then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter were being grilled about uh, by Congress about the war against ISIS. And this was like in 2014, I believe that these congressmen were asking him, you know, like, has ISIS grown? Have they shrunken? What's going on with ISIS? And Dunford was very frank and very sincere. He said, look, like they have um, strategically, they have or tactically, we've beaten them, but strategically they have grown. And then they and then one of the guys, Randy Forbes, who is a, a representative for Virginia, um, just asked point blank. He said, you know, Ash Carter said we're at war with ISIS. Like who declared that war? And General Dunford said, well, if it was a declaration, it would have come from the Congress. He's like, but did that, did, you know, Ash Carter said we're at war with ISIS. Are we at war? And then they both kind of like look at each other and then give like, should you answer? Should I answer? I don't know what to say. And, and then General Dunford just kind of rolls his eyes and says, well, no, we're not technically at war. And, and then Ash Carter comes in to try to do damage control, but then Representative Forbes makes a really good point, says, well, if we haven't declared a war, how do we even know what our, our strategy is if we haven't even declared what we're supposed to be doing? <laughs> like, that's just, that's it in a nutshell. We don't have like an overall arching strategy. It's just, we win tactically, but like, like the Germans in World War II, you can have, you can win tactically, but you lose strategically. So, Yeah, it's lost victories. How much understanding of ISIS did they really have if they openly allowed them to recruit on Twitter and social media? I mean, they didn't even have an understanding of how they recruit. Right. I mean, but either way, terrorism is an idea. It's not a army. It's not a country. Like, you can't defeat an idea with an army. Like, you can't. I mean, 
if you want to talk fourth generation war, you can, you know, the Hama model, you can crush them for 30 days at a time and then achieve an objective. But then after that, you have to de-escalate like cops do. So until we get that through our heads, like forget about, you know, killing as many, we're playing whack-a-mole. We're, we're hitting all these terrorists all over and then new ones pop up. We'll be there, you know, for a hundred more years at minimum. And nothing will change if we stay for a hundred years. Right. So. Anyway, we've beaten that one to death. Uh, Brent, you had some thoughts about... Well, uh, well wait, 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 wait. Uh, Jeff, I think you had a news article or something that you wanted to talk about, too. Yeah, there was something that popped up here on uh, December 28th, and it was on, it's on Yahoo News. It's same-sex Navy couple faces backlash for recreating iconic World War II kiss. We're just showing our love for each other. So long story short, a... Sailor just got back from a deployment. He won a lottery to be the first kiss off of the boat. And his um, husband came up and they essentially recreated, you know, the the photo in New York where the uh, the nurse and that uh, sailor are kissing. So they recreate it. Apparently, there's a lot of backlash, uh, blah, 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 in some of the newspapers. But I mean, this is just the. I, I guess I want to talk just a little bit about what I saw in the military as I was leaving. So. In 1994, Bill Clinton signed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That was that was Bill Clinton that signed it. No one had a problem with it. It was law for 16 years. 2010 comes around. Barack Obama repeals Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That happens. And then we go towards women in combat. And the Marine Corps did tests with all female teams and all male teams. And the results, what the Marine Corps reported, were very clear. All male teams are the best, and that's what we want. And Ray Mabus, who was... Obama's secretary of the Navy said, you guys are prejudiced from the get go. You didn't do a fair test, integrate females. Like, so they saluted smartly. And then what came after that was transgenderism in the military. And as you know, Bill well uh, knows cultural Marxism doesn't work as a, they don't go to one extreme. It's like boiling a frog in water. They push you and then they step back. They push you and they step back until you're already at the edge, you're at the edge of a cliff and you didn't even know how you got there. But I'm looking at, uh, this transgender integration training that I did in the military right before I got out. So this was in January of 2017. And this was before Trump got inaugurated, but he was president elect. And so this has been going for, you know, many months. So it's full court press. And then I just want to talk about the, the gender transition process where a, a Marine who has gender dysphoria then uh, can, once they do the transition, they can go through what's called real life experience where they, live in the opposite sex that they chose and then they can get exemptions for their grooming standards so if they were a male and then they became you know a female they may not have to have the perfect hair or be able to do all the push-ups and crunches until they're you know completely transitioned but when i saw that picture and you know it's just like things like that wouldn't pass for in our military five and six seven years ago are just unthinkable are now in the mainstream and then transgenderism if it wasn't for trump there would be openly transgender service members in the military that we're one, you know, president away from that actually happening. And it's just scary stuff. What's going on in the military. Yeah. And now all the military facilities are going to have to have three restrooms. His, hers, and it's right. The, the point militarily is what does this all do to unit cohesion? The introduction of the women, the gay, the open gays, the the quote transgendered unquote which are simply mentally ill narcissists all of this is ripping any cohesion apart it's putting sending it's setting everybody against everybody else mm -hmm. and when you take a unit where everybody is at everybody else's throat and you put it under the stress of combat it disintegrates whether it's a, a, an infantry unit or a ship's crew or whatever right. And we're going to see that happen, and it's not going to be pretty. Yep. But yeah, that, that was the uh, the last uh, the news article I wanted to talk about. And then when I saw the local at the end. <clears throat> Dave Babylon. <laughs> yes, without hanging gardens. <laughs> yeah, so uh, like I said, we'll just go through, uh, we'll go around the room. And we'll each pick a moment from 2018 that we thought was impactful or that we thought was interesting. And we'll use that as a jumping off point to spark some more conversation. Uh, for, for me, the, the moment that stood out the most politically or, 
really otherwise was the North Korea summit. Uh, North Korea agreed to work towards denuclearization. Um, and the North and South, uh, the leaders of the North and South met under what really seemed like genuine friendly terms. Uh, it remains to be seen what, if anything, will come out of that. But I, I thought the, <laughs> the imagery was really, uh, it, it was impactful for me. I, I thought that was, uh, it was interesting to see, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what comes of it. Hopefully, Trump will be remembered as the president that ended the Korean War. Who knows? Which is still technically going on. There has been no peace treaty. But this is interesting, Brent, because here we saw the president break through the Washington establishment, the foreign policy and military establishment, tell him to pound sand and move to try to solve longstanding conflict. We've since watched that same Washington establishment, including people in his White House, specifically John Bolton, do everything in their power to undermine President Trump's achievement in that, in that meeting with Kim Jong-un. Uh, specifically, what they, are, what they are forcing or trying to force on the North Koreans is where they get no relief from sanctions until their denuclearization is complete. Well, that's never going to fly. And they know it's not going to fly because, and of course, that's what they want. They're trying to sabotage this deal because it's humiliating for Kim Jong-un and for North Korea. It's treating them like a defeated power. They're not a defeated power, and they know they're not. If we are going to bring what the president did to fruition, and he clearly wants to, he's talking about another meeting with Kim, we're going to have to have an agreement where as they take certain steps, we take certain steps. So it's equal treatment. In Asian culture, that's of supreme importance. And if uh, Kim were to agree to anything else, it would be a tremendous loss of face. Again, the interesting thing to me is that even within the Trump White House, not just in the State Department, not just in the Pentagon, but within his White House in such key positions as his national security advisor, it, it's very naked how they are doing everything in their power to sabotage peace with North Korea and continue the Korean conflict. Yeah, very well said. I mean, if you look at all of Trump's plays, for, I mean, even with Iran, like after he tweeted, like, don't ever threaten the U.S. of A., right after that, similar to North Korea, he does his pacing and leading technique where he goes to one end and says something ridiculous, and then he starts moving back to the center. He did the same thing with North Korea, you know, little rocket man, and here they are having a summit. He did the same thing with Iran, and then he tweeted a day after, like, I'm willing to meet with the leaders of Iran, like, no conditions, we'll sit down and talk. And then Pompeo intervenes and says, oh, no, we can't do that. It's the same story all around. Trump's instincts are telling him what to do, and he's right. But then the people that he hired, so bad on him for that, are, are you know, trying to trip him up. But with, with Korea specifically, I mean, after having been there for two deployments, it's, it's fascinating to see how lopsided the contest between a South-North Korea matchup would be. South Korea spends about $40 billion a year, on, not that who has the most in the, you know, best tanks wins, but there is something to be said for how much you spend on your military. And South Korea spends $40 billion a year on their military. The entire GDP of North Korea is about $40 billion. And so this is not a fair fight at all. And North Korea knows that. And if they would give up their nukes, they would be giving up the only thing that could prevent them from being, you know, invaded possibly by the South. So they're never going to give up their nukes. And until we get through the, that through our heads that they're not going to denuclearize, then the peace process can go forward. But if you have these people clamoring for, oh, he's got to give up his nukes first, like, not going to happen. And that's, it's stupid. Can you really blame him for wanting nukes? I mean, no. one of the things in 4GW is legitimacy. What gives you more legitimacy than having that big red button? Well, we right. didn't have yeah, this, this is same. a more general situation. We're talking about states here, but the nuclear weapon is, is the weak state's uh, equalizer. No question about it. Uh, the North is very vulnerable. It knows it's very vulnerable. We say, well, of course, we're not going to invade North Korea. And we've told them that. Well, we've invaded a number of other countries uh, pretty much out of the blue. And uh, John Bolton even 
said at one point, again, trying to sabotage the deal with North Korea, well, this is the Libya model. Well, Kim is very aware of what happened to Gaddafi. Well, isn't Bolton the guy that uh, claimed that there was WMDs in Iraq? Oh, of course. Yeah, yes, of course. absolutely. So, uh, again, you're absolutely right, Jeff. Trump's instincts on policy are generally correct. His instincts on who to hire are terrible. Yeah. What? Let's talk about reunification. Um, is that even a remote possibility in the, in the near future? It is a possibility, and it's one that scares the crap out of South Korea. Because they would, I mean, if you look at the East-West German unification and what that cost West, the former West Germany, uh, that was easy compared to North and South Korea because East Germany's standard of living uh, was at least European. North Korea is one of the poorest countries on earth and South Korea is now a very rich country. So the, the asset transfers that would be required the, the expenditures that would be required for North, South Korea to bring North Korea up to its level uh, are, are mind-boggling. If there's going to be reunification, unless it's catastrophic reunifications where North Korea collapses and suddenly it's just, uh -huh, hey, there's no more border, we want to join South Korea. Politically, South Korea can't say no. Can't say, I, we want to have two Koreas because its legitimacy depends on the notion of one Korea, but it would, it, it would be absolutely catastrophic. Absent that, this is a process that would take half a century to, to build the North Korean economy up slowly to a level where it could be integrated with the South. <clears throat> That's all I had on, on Korea. I just thought that was uh, interesting and uh, honestly, there's not a whole lot to say about it at this point because nothing has actually uh, happened. So we'll have to look into 2019 and watch as hopefully things change on that front. Bill, uh, what was your moment of 2018 that stood out to you? Well, it actually ties into this very well. It's the moment we've just seen over the last couple of weeks where the president very clearly broke with the generals and ordered us to get out of Syria, which, again, the deep state is doing its utmost to, to undermine that decision, and to begin the withdrawal from Afghanistan and get serious about negotiating that withdrawal with the, the obvious winners, the Taliban. Uh, he had to break a great deal of China in Washington to do this, and he didn't hesitate to do it. Over and over, we've seen him paralyzed, by, uh, again, these, some people, some of them in his own administration, but particularly by the generals, because as a newcomer to Washington, he was overawed in these meetings. They've got all the stars and they've got all the medals and all of this kind of stuff. I think he's finally figured out that, as we heard earlier in the piece about General Dumfries, that these guys are, in most cases, losers. Uh, they don't know how to fight the kinds of wars that the world now fights, fourth generation wars. They have lost those conflicts repeatedly. All they really care about is, is money and careers. And I think he, the scales have finally fallen from his eyes about these guys, and he's broken with them. If that carries on into 2019, I think we may see the peace president that we thought we were electing in 2016. And that means overriding them on North Korea and making a deal that uh, Kim can live with. It means if we don't pull out of Syria, if we don't pull out of Afghanistan as he's ordered, heads roll. And um, it means that we start to return to being a normal country in a world where there is not a big superpower rival, where we do not have to play the make weight against a country that is trying to take over the world as the Soviet communism, that was certainly its objective. That's gone. And there's no reason we should not return to our historic policy, which is not isolationism, 
It is where we relate to other countries around the world, primarily through the private means of trade and by serving as an example, rather than by playing the great power game and relating to other countries primarily through military force. That is a potentially historic turning point. Should have happened a long time ago. Should have happened when the Cold War ended, if not earlier. But it may finally happen starting this year if what we've seen in the past few weeks is, in fact, a turning point that I think it may be. Uh, regarding, you know, gearing up to fight great powers, do you think that we'll ever, well, do you think a war with China would ever be on the horizon? Uh, it seems like if there's going to be a big uh, power clash, it's going to be between the U.S. and China. Uh, what what would you say about that? Well, it can happen by accident. Uh, we can back into a situation where neither the United States nor China feels it can back down, and we get a clash of some sort. That would be disastrous strategically for both parties. When we look at China, well, really when we look at the rest of the world, but in this case, particularly China, we need to do so through a fourth generation warfare lens because that's the way the world is going. The great threat that we face in the 21st century is not a competitive peer country like China or Russia. It is the threat of state disintegration and the fall of the state system itself. That's what's at stake as we confront these fourth generation non-state entities that replace states when states fail, as we've seen in Libya, Syria, where fortunately, thanks to the Russians, not us, the state does seem to be prevailing. And uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, and elsewhere. The great danger that China faces, and the Chinese are very much aware of this because they're certainly aware of their own history, is coming apart internally and going back into a period of warring states. This would be catastrophic in terms of preserving the state system. We need a strong united China that is a partner of the US and Russia in preserving the state system. If China were to fall into internal chaos, which it's done many times in its history, this would be an enormous step toward a world, again, of chaos, the chaos that occurs without the state. And the danger, if we get into a military confrontation with China, is it's a lose-lose proposition from our perspective. If the Chinese beat us, we lose. If we beat the Chinese, and that delegitimizes the current Chinese government, that could precipitate an internal breakup within China, again, of the sort we've seen so often in Chinese history. And then we really lose, because we lose at the grand strategic level in the contest that is going to shape the 21st century, which is not between freedom and a dictatorship, it's between order and disorder between the state and statelessness. Great. Um, <clears throat> Jeff, did you have a moment that stood out to you in 2018? Yeah, uh, I do, but I just wanted to hit on one thing Bill said there at the end. Yeah, go ahead. Bill, do you think that, I mean, with the way our foreign policy you know, establishment is going, they have to have enemies and they're doing, I mean, I, I'm, no, I'm no seer, but what I see happening might be one of the biggest, like, foreign policy blunders like 20 years from now like we are driving russia and china into each other's arms because of our stupidity so we're taking the two powers we should be friends with and making them friends because we have to have enemies because of what good would our 800 bases across the world be if we don't have enemies so you know we should be allies with them like trump's one man he's hiring the wrong people he can only do so much i mean i just i have a hard time seeing the fiscal inertia the, the military industrial congressional media complex has to the only thing that I think can take it off the rails is the debt crisis. I don't see any other way around like getting our strategy in the right direction, but I just, I know we should be friends with Russia and China, but I don't see it happening because there's just too much money to be lost and we're pushing them into each other's arms. And yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, well, you're right. <clears throat> the, the fact that Russia and China have, are allying is not a bad thing. 
the fact that they're allying against us, and it's our fault, not theirs, is a very bad thing because it should be a three-way alliance. An alliance of the three great powers is the beginning of what you need in an alliance to preserve the state system worldwide. If the three great powers aren't the basis of that alliance, if there's, if there's hostility among those three great powers, you will never get the kind of alliance you need to preserve the state system. So you're correct. You're also correct about the motivation. Uh, the biggest trough in Washington is the uh, national security function, to use the budget committee's uh, terminology. It's the defense budget plus a whole lot of other different budgets that ultimately are part of national security. And you're right that to maintain the current military establishment, to justify it, you have to have these peer competitors. It's absurd because they're both nuclear powers. We're not going to engage deliberately. Again, we can by accident, we can back into something, but we are not deliberately going to engage in a conventional conflict with a nuclear power because whoever is losing is under tremendous pressure to escalate to the nuclear level. That's why we didn't directly engage American and Soviet forces throughout the whole Cold War. Too much of a danger of escalation. That logic still applies. But you're right. What motivates our hostility toward Russia and China, which is strategically counterproductive, is purely the need to keep the trough full. My first uh, question about China uh in regards to whether or not we would fight them in the future. That was a comment from the live chat from Slapout again. Um, we've got another comment from the chat. Lance Burkhardt says, China's Communist Party seems unstable given their paranoia, social credit, totalitarianism, increased persecution of Christians. So that, that might play into the fourth generation war question and a reason why China certain, certainly wouldn't want to start a major conflict because it's one more element that would uh, tear things apart. Exactly. The Chinese government is very much aware that uh, they are on somewhat shaky ground. They're dealing with nationalism that can spin out of control and force them into confrontations they don't want. They are dealing with the effects of uneven development. Some parts of the country are prospering, others are not. They are dealing with the consequences of some very bad decisions, like essentially trying to eliminate all the small farms and small farmers. That's going to turn around and bite them. And their own legitimacy is, is shaky because technically they're about Karl Marx and communism and Marxism-Leninism. And in fact, it's a capitalist country. So it's a case of one foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. And yes, that is driving them to greater repression. The deal they struck with the Chinese people is we run politics and you get rich. And the Chinese economy is slowing. When the international debt crisis hits, and I think it will start in China, then their legitimacy is going to be under severe pressure because they won't be fulfilling their part of the deal anymore. All of these things point to the danger that China could become unstable internally, and again, given its historic tendencies, it could break up into warring states. And that is something that, from the American perspective, we, above all, do not want. We need China as a center of order, not a center of disorder in this century. Yeah, they're stuck in the fires of revolution just with their surveillance policies that they've adopted. Um, there's been social credit score things that are going on, where based on what you say online, that determines your social credit score. Um, and that's when it gets dangerous. And that's when people start to realize, hmm, maybe this government isn't actually for our interests, which they should have already. But Well, except again, as long as the government is, is, is producing prosperity, you have to remember that just 30 years Same ago, thing. China was dirt poor. Yeah, but we weren't poor 30 years ago. We're poor now. Right. China was incredibly poor just 30 years ago. And now many Chinese enjoy what is even by American standards a middle class standard of living. I mean, this is enormous change for the good from the standpoint of the average Chinese, at least those in the areas where the economy is booming. That's not all about China. Uh, the problem comes when you couple what you're talking about with, a, with an economy that's 
on the skids. Oh yeah, yeah. It it's not going to be a revolutionary situation as long as as the prosperity rolls. It's when that ends. Oh yeah. That then all of people's resentments of of one party control uh, come to the fore. Oh, I mean that's the same thing that's happening here. We have essentially one party. Yes. People are, right. are are content with staying quiet as long as they have the two SUVs in the front yard. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything seems to be fine on the surface, but it's when, like you mentioned, things start to go haywire, especially with the economy, that people start to question, hmm, maybe I don't want to stay silent anymore. A few years ago, when I was still living in Washington, I had uh, lunch at his request with, I think it was the third secretary of the Russian embassy. And we agreed over lunch, this is a one-party state. Oh, yeah. I said, we're just more clever than the Bolsheviks. <laughs> Because we tell people there are two parties and they don't notice that regardless of which one wins, nothing changes. You, you turn political politics into sports. Yes, yeah, sports exactly. Teams. And yeah. that, of course, is again why the establishment loathes President Trump, because he represents actually something different. Yep. He is not simply one or another wing of the one party. Right. Yeah, for, so for uh, my news piece, a little egotistical here, but I... Uh, I'll use a piece of uh, history that I got an article in American Conservative for, and it was for the uh, the 40th anniversary of uh, Zolzhenitsyn's uh, speech to Harvard in 1978. It's called A World Split Apart. And so when I was writing my book, I had all my different chapters and stuff, and I had to like, you know, put it all together and have like a theme, like what is what is my motive for writing? What ties everything together? And I like I was sitting on it for four or five months and then I came across that speech and through actually the American conservative like posted it, I think, a year or something about Zolzhenitsyn. And I found him very interesting. And so I started reading up on him and I found that speech and I just found it so prescient and so um, just accurate about the state of America. And he saw back in 1970, I mean, and for the Christians, like 40, what is 40 years in the Bible correspond to the time of trial and testing probationary period? I mean, it's a it's a number that God, for whatever reason, chose. But that was the 40th anniversary of his speech. And I wrote a piece for American Conservative about, you know, this is the state of our country that Zolzhenitsyn talked about in 1978. And here we are today, consumed by materialism and vanity. And we have our freedom. But where has that freedom gone? Has it made us, quote unquote, happier? Well, not really. People are more upset and more angry at each other than they've ever been. And his speech, the the crux of what I'm trying to get at is that Zolzhenitsyn saw our country as the founding of our country. Our freedom was never meant to be freedom from responsibility. It wasn't meant to be freedom to satisfy whims or anything like that. It was freedom from the government. It was liberty. It wasn't the French Revolution's motto of you know freedom, equality, and those things. It was our our motto was liberty. We understood that there wasn't equal equal outcomes, but there was still a sense of allegiance to your country and to your cause and to your nation. That's gone away for the most part in our country. And I, I, I really, really loved his speech. I really love him as a writer. And I've read a lot of his other books. And I can't say enough good things about, uh, about Zolzhenitsyn. And they also just recently in Russia unveiled a uh, statue um, about when Putin was uh, there, like dedicating it and everything. He actually, there's a video of Putin giving him an award, I think at 2000. Um, and he, you know, he passed away in 2008. But I just thought for the traditionalism piece of, you know, what are our website and the, the movement is about is, is that, you know, true traditionalism means not just freedom from, you know, freedom from the government. It's about giving something back to your country and being part of something bigger. And he, Zolzhenitsyn understood that, you know, human nature is completely corrupted and that Russia and the United States, you know, were in a bad situation, but for different reasons, the Russian state crushed people's souls, you know, through totalitarianism. But he's like, the American system, why you think you're better? Well, your souls are also crushed, too, because you have too much freedom. He dared to stand in front of America at the height of the Cold War and tell everyone that was salivating for, you know, freedom worship. He said, no, this you've gone too far. You're already going too far and you're going to be in trouble for it. And here we are 40 years later. And the guy was a the guy was a prophet. So that was my uh, favorite moment of just recreating his uh, 40th anniversary speech and writing a piece about it. It's interesting to me that people don't even know what freedom is. We hear the word tossed around here, there, and everywhere. It's not some impossible right to do whatever you feel like at the moment and suffer no consequences. That is what the founders of this country called license, not liberty. Freedom 
is the right to substitute self-discipline for the imposed discipline of the state. And if the people cannot discipline themselves, then the only choices are chaos or discipline coming from the state. We unfortunately increasingly are showing that we can't handle freedom, that we cannot discipline ourselves. And we see this in American life across the board, particularly among the elites. That's a and tremendous responsibility. It's a tremendous responsibility. And if you look at previous generation of, of Americans, they understood this. Yeah. Uh, their lives were disciplined, it was self-discipline, but it was very real discipline. There were many things they said, we're not going to do them because they are wrong. Now, the notion is anything goes, and again, you have some right to do whatever you feel like at the moment, however wild or bizarre it is, and suffer no consequences. And this is productive only of chaos. So yes, Solzhenitsyn was absolutely right. He saw where we were going, and we've gone far down that road. It's a question of can we recover an ability to exercise freedom, or are we going to have to be governed? Right. Uh, but I know you said uh, we, when we spoke earlier or, or at a different time, you said, you know, America is going to miss the... Uh, we're going to miss 1984, but we're headed towards a brave new world. Could you expound upon that a little bit? Yes. When I was young, which was a while ago, <laughs> uh, in junior high, in fact, we had to read two t t alternative totalitarian futures. The one was 1984, which was Stalin's Soviet Union. Well, that danger passed with the fall of Soviet communism. The other <clears throat> is Brave New World, that Aldous Huxley's novel, short novel written in the 1930s, which was remarkable for foreseeing where we're going now. It's a totalitarianism where the most important rule is you must be happy. And the state makes you happy by providing, allowing, encouraging every kind of a deviant behavior that's pleasurable in a sensual sense. Uh, that uh, the, the, only, the only thing illegal in Brave New World in terms of sex is marriage and children. Uh, the kids all come from test tubes. Every other kind of sex is legitimate. Um, it is a culture where everything is dominated by entertainment and where the ultimate control comes <clears throat> not just through psychological conditioning, which we already have in droves, and that of course was the Frankfurt School and cultural Marxism, it works by psychological conditioning, but by genetic conditioning. And of course that piece is now falling into place with genetic engineering to where you were genetically engineered so that essentially you cannot be or do anything except what the state wants. And you're happy doing it. And if you're not, here's some drugs. Yes, and if you're not, here's some drugs. Well. The, the drug in Brave New World is called Soma, and it gives you instantly happy. Ritalin is Soma for kids. We have gone a long way down the road of Brave New World, and everybody, if, the, if you want to see where we're headed, it's a short novel, it's an easy read, read Brave New World. And I will bet the kids in school now do not read it, as we did, for, because precisely it's too close to what we see happening all around us. Yeah, long. yeah. I, I right. it's, it's more than 140 characters. They can't read it. <laughs> I recently read a, a book. Um, I've, I'd heard of him when I read uh, Strange Death of Europe by Murray. It's just, that's a very good book, too, about how Europe has lost its, you know, its faith in itself and is just has this guilt complex and talks about migration. But he talked about a, a French author named uh, Mikhail Huelbeck. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard of him. But he's uh, yes. Yeah, he, I, I, Rod Dreher from American Conservative recommended him. And I, he said, start with his first book. And so I read his first book. It's called Elementary Particles. And it's uh, it's a very good snapshot of, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of autobiogra autobiographical slightly, but it kind of talks about his life as a young man in the 1960s in France. I mean, it is like a, it reads a lot like Brave New World, just like drugs orgies like kids all over the place they don't have parents like it's it's a but it's very dark and like 
you know, it has a moral underpinning to it. It's, it's a really good book. But McQuell, and he also wrote another book, McQuell Beck did, about um, that the Muslims have now, it's a futuristic novel that um, there is a, the front national gets defeated and then the socialists make a pact with uh, the Muslim, a Muslim party that's come into being in France and they institute Sharia law. He got all this flack for publishing it. The day after he published it is when there was that attack on Charlie Hebdo magazine, the satirical magazine in France, and people were giving him all this flack. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute. Wait, maybe you were right about some of these things. You're right about. But yeah, well, Hellbeck's a uh, really good author. Well, it's very interesting because if you look at the impact that the French intelligentsia has had on Western culture, really since the 17th century, and of course, particularly in the misnamed Enlightenment in the 18th century, it, it's been tremendous. And now we're seeing a very important and little remarked shift among French intellectuals to the right. Welbeck is part of that. There are a number of others. Uh, jean Lotz Pale's book, a uh, considerably earlier book, The Camp of the Saints, that has proven pr prophetic. And <clears throat> A shift of this kind on the part of the French intelligentsia will have very long-term effects throughout Western culture. It's a very important development, and I just hope that it uh, it continues. The cultural Marxists, of course, are trying to to uh, literally outlaw it by calling it hate speech, hate being any open dissent from cultural Marxism. Uh, but that's hard to do in France, and uh, more and more of these voices are being heard. So. It's an important development, more important than most Americans understand. Yeah. Johnny, did you have a, an item from the the, yeah. uh, the, week, the the year in review? Yeah, uh, so I was actually going to continue the thread of the foreign uh, developments. I enjoyed Trump's uh, stance on actually making deals with other countries in our interests. That was good. But actually, as, as we were talking, I thought of actually the Kavanaugh nomination for me. It was actually a, a pretty a powerful statement, at least, to, to send to white men of, of America, because I think that's where we stand the biggest problem, against the biggest problem, um, just with, obviously, dualities being uh, combated against, basically, all the, the feminist movement, the transgender movement that we mentioned earlier, all of these things are against natural order. I mentioned Babylon. That's exactly what happened in Babylon. It's destroying all, all culture, all duality, and replacing them with one global uh, caliphate, basically, um, cabal. And for me, the, Cal uh, the Kavanaugh nomination was a big surprise because I thought it was going to go the same way all other things go when it comes to a woman accusing a man of anything. We throw out the justice system and say, if you're guilty before proven innocent, we throw out all our uh, legal system. And that's a dangerous, that would have set a very dangerous precedent if that ruined his life over a farce that it ended up being. So for me, the Kavanaugh nomination sent a message at least to me that there's there's a glimmer of hope for these kinds of things to maybe be resolved in the legal means and the political means. Do I think that that's going to change anything long term right now? Maybe not. Um, but at least to send a message, I like the message it sent that they stuck to their guns and said, look, the, these allegations are completely baseless um, and we're going to fight this. So for me, it was more of a, uh, I guess, a, a silent victory as far as that goes. But for me, that was a big moment in uh, 2018 politics. It was, really it was impressive that they didn't back down uh, was, because uh, Republicans, uh, Republicans seem to really enjoy doing that. Uh, as soon as anybody accuses them of anything, they say, oh, well, you know what, you're right. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, I'll roll over. You can take whatever you want. But yeah. they actually stood up and fought. And that, that was a big blow to the left. I, I never thought I would agree with Mitch McConnell. Or Lindsey Graham. Or Lindsey Graham, right. Um, so, you know, for some of these politicians to actually stand for something, to me, it was nice to see. Oh, they scared themselves to death. Oh, you have to realize that. And that this is a traumatic experience for them. But the, um, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is the left brought in its biggest boogeyman. Uh, again, these accusations of improper conduct with women. I mean, it's funny because yeah. these people on the one hand have the morality of Stokes, and on the other hand, I, then anything that might offend a woman, we have to take as we would in the most serious of the Victorian uh, yep. salon. Uh, the Victorians knew you all agree, you always agree that the woman is right, and then you ignore her and do what needs to be done. 
Uh, and that's kind of what we did uh, with the Kavanaugh Absolutely. nomination. Yep. So they, the left trotted out its boogeyman and in effect, we said, we're not scared, go away. Who cares? We're gonna vote the way we, we need to vote. Right. And that is a very severe defeat for them because once people realize that the boogeyman are nothing but boogeyman, right. Uh, then suddenly their power disappears. Right? In other words, when you're not scared anymore, being called a word that ends in ism, uh, what can they do? They can just scream those words ever, ever louder. My reply to them always is that's ismism. That's thinking you can negate <laughs> realities by calling them names ending in ism. Right. Yeah, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. Oh, right. If, if someone is offended, which is merely a momentary emotional condition, my answer is, Find the telephone and call your mother. She may have a reason to care. Nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think it was a it, it was a good lesson for for the right because I mean as we as we can see now the they completely dropped the issue as soon as the 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 confirmation had concluded. Uh, it was over. Nobody talks about it anymore. They move on to the next item in the news cycle. Um, the right hopefully learned something from this. Uh, <clears throat> you, they have to learn how to work the 24-hour news cycle. Because it moves so fast, just don't acknowledge these things. Don't acknowledge an accusation that, of course, is baseless. Of course, they're using it to you know, attack somebody because they, they want to win. Don't acknowledge it. Don't give them the time of day. Stand strong and move on because that's that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, it's a very dangerous thing for a government, a system, a people, for everyone to feel that just because it's true, it doesn't matter because you're going to be buried. And that was a good message to send to, I think, to, you know, you know, middle class white guys to say, hey, at least there's a light at the end of the tunnel with this. Somebody stood up for what is right and what is true. Um, so that was good to see. That was a good message to send. Remember, though, that the Republicans only did that because of the hot breath of President Trump on them. Their, their ultimate nightmare, perhaps any politician's ultimate nightmare, is having to take a courageous stand. Right. Uh, because yeah. they aren't courageous. Um, if they were, they wouldn't have succeeded in politics. They only did it because the base that supports President Trump, including the base among their own voters in their own states that supports President Trump, were demanding it. If uh, we'd had President Romney, even if a, a Kavanaugh had been nominated, you would never have seen the Republicans have the guts to uh, uh, to not be frightened by the boogeyman. Oh, sure. Yeah. Or boogie women, in this case, would be more precise. Right. Uh, so we got several comments and uh, emails and whatnot over the last few days. So uh, we can move on to read some of those if you guys are ready. We're ready. All right. Let me pull it up here. Uh, I had a brief interaction with some on Twitter with somebody named Evan. He had an interesting comment uh, in regards to cultural Marxism. He says that he doesn't agree with the term because he says it's an imprecise term that obscures more than it clarifies and causes people to mix, misdiagnose the causes of our problems. Also, the Frankfurt School had relatively little to say on questions of race and gender that preoccupy so many lefties and righties now. Basically, our chief problems are capitalism and liberalism. That's not to say that certain groups are not nepotistic and subversive, but we need to take a step back and examine the totality, the whole when examining cause and effect. Okay. I think the term cultural Marxism is important and useful because on the one hand, these guys were Marxists, the people who gave us what we now know as political correctness. And that includes on the race and gender issues. That's much, he's right about the early work of the Frankfurt School and particularly that of Horkheimer Adorno from uh, and Reich. But he's leaving out Marcuse. The guy who, inter who introduces the, the in attention to women's issues and to race is Marcuse. Now, Marcuse is a member of the Frankfurt School. He joined it shortly before it left Germany. And Horkheimer had left open the question of who will be the agents of revolution 
because he said it will not be the working class. They're becoming part of the middle class, which is what they want to do. He was right. Marcuse answers that in the 50s, saying it will be a coalition of blacks, feminist women, gays, and various other marginal groups. And Marcuse gives us the focus on women's issues and the focus on race, because those were two very important very important components of the revolutionary coalition as he defined it. The, on the one hand, these guys are Marxists. I mean, and they're writing to each other. They're very open about the fact, hey, we're all Marxists. But on the other hand, you, ha you can't just call it Marxism because then you confuse it with the Marxism-Leninism of the Soviet Union. This is not, and I, I've always said this and stressed it, this is not the Marxism of Moscow. Uh, from Moscow's perspective, these guys were heretics. It's a different school of Marxism. And you see that on the tape, which I don't know if it's up on our website yet. If not, it should be soon. Uh, the video history of political correctness, when he, Martin Jay, who's the principal American academic expert on the Frankfurt School, uh, is talking, he says, this is, a, a, it's Marxism, but it's a different school of Marxism. And he's right, it is. There's more than one variety of Marxism. This variety is best distinguished from the Marxism, Marxism of the Soviet Union by its focus on culture. And that makes it cultural Marxism. Excellent. Uh, Bill, one thing that I, I've heard you say a lot of times is that as soon as the general public understands that what we're seeing is a form of Marxism, that they'll immediately reject it. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I don't think the term Marxism has as much weight as it did during the Cold War. That's partly true, although most people are still aware of Marxism. I mean, younger people I know learn virtually nothing about any of these sorts of things in school. But I think there's still a fairly broad recognition within society that Marxism is not a good thing. I mean... Just Soviet Marxism killed not, 60, not 6 million people, but 60 million people. Marxism is the great mass murderer of the 20th century, much more so than, than fascism or national socialism. So there is certainly a residual memory among Americans. I mean, here in Cleveland, all the people we have from Central and Eastern Europe, believe me, they remember that Marxism is not a good thing. The, the reason I think exposing political correctness as what it is, cultural Marxism, is powerful is because it delegitimizes it. And remember the, the essence of the contest in a fourth generation world, the world we are moving into, it's a contest for legitimacy. Um, and I think that something that delegitimizes the left to the degree that the realization of what they're for is cultural Marxism does it's powerful. The left itself is very much afraid of this. They hate being revealed as cultural Marxists. In some European countries, they're trying to make the term illegal hate speech. An email we got is kind of long, but it's good. Um, so I'll, I'll read it. There's a couple of questions, so we'll take it in pieces. Uh, Non-state, this is from a person called P PR Caldude. Uh, Non-state forces tend to be evil, Mujahideen and drug cartels. These groups have access to an unlimited supply of money to buy weapons and governments. The former is funded through Islamic charities and the latter through drug sales. The people they oppress live generally in poverty and can't buy arms to defend themselves. For example, for example Boko Haram appears to be killing Nigerian Christians under the guise of Fulani herdsmen who are supported by the Muslim president of Nigeria. The Christian farmers are dirt poor. What 4GW warfare strategy should they take to obtain peace and security? And then he has, uh, in addition to that, also, how do you win on a moral level on 4GW when morality is inverted as it is in the U.S. and so many other countries? Boko Haram is acting morally under their religious system. Uh, the, yeah, the question is a good one. As far as how poor farmers defeat fourth generation opponents, given that the poor farmers can't afford AK-47s, is they have to find allies who have money. 
Uh, that is a role, of course, that powers acting in defense of the state system can play, which is why I think we need ideally an alliance of all states in uh, defense of the state system. Where there is even a residual state, such as in Nigeria, uh, they may be able to get the material they need from the state, either openly or surreptitiously. Those states, of course, uh, uh, everything is very porous. So uh, <clears throat> arms can flow out of the military in considerable numbers and never be missed. And they have to also organize so that they get the moral high ground. The moral level is decisive, as, as Boyd argued. And they, though Boko Haram presents itself as having the power of weakness, to use Van Krefeld's state term, via the state, the poor farmers very clearly are weak via the Boko Haram. So to the degree that the farmers can present themselves as being the weak, being oppressed by the strong, they gain the moral high ground. They have to do both. In other words, you need the moral high ground, but you also need weapons. And the weapons are going to have to come through an alliance with someone else. It would be nice in cases like that if we had a Christian alliance that would provide things like weapons. Unfortunately, the spirit of the men, the men of the First Crusade who took Jerusalem from the uh, from the Muslims is not much in evidence among Christian churches these days. Uh, maybe we need, the last Pope to wear armor, I think was Julius II. Maybe it's time for a Julius III. Hmm. Is it possible to take moral high ground by playing the victim? Yes, and in fact, that's what the fourth generation forces do all the time. Uh, you see it most markedly with the Palestinians via the Israel. Where they play this, they play that game very, very effectively, and Israel's finding itself um, isolated internationally at the moral level. You have this massive movement to disinvest in anything that benefits Israel. You have all kinds of boycotts of Israel and Israeli products. This is all because the Palestinians are very good at using the power of weakness. Uh, the next part of the email is, similarly, Mexicans and other Latin Americans, when they aren't working for the cartels, are pressed by them. Mexicans tend to be richer than others, but still can't buy all the equipment or, or government officials, federales, and cops that the cartels can. What should oppressed Latin Americans do since their states are hollowed out, by, hollowed out by the cartels, but don't have the money to buy all the weapons and equipment that the cartels have? He's got another addition to that that says, um, let's see. Uh, aspects of Mexican culture seem to revere the cartels. At best, many of these cultures are bifurcated morally. Uh, those two parts are actually related. In yeah. other words, when we're talking about Mexico, unlike, say, Nigerian farmers, there is enough money among the population to buy weapons. They can arm themselves and organize. But at the moral level, and again, that's decisive, the cartels are regarded as something good by many of the common people because the cartels at least are an alternative to an utterly corrupt state that takes their taxes and gives them nothing in return except treating them very badly. So <clears throat> the problem becomes how do you and this is an extraordinarily difficult one, and I don't know Mexico well enough to know whether there is an answer, much less what it is. How do you take a corrupt state and make it uncorrupt again, turn it into a government that actually serves the people, and that the people therefore regard as legitimate? That would isolate the cartels effectively enough that the cartels would be in serious trouble. Again, the average Mexican can't afford a weapon. The cart, if, where the cartels are smart, and some of them are and many of them aren't, but where they are smart, and this is true of fourth generation entities generally, we see this most markedly with Hezbollah, they do not oppress the people. On the contrary, they provide the services that the state is supposed to provide but does not. 
And because that model, as we see with Hezbollah, is the most effective in terms of getting results, I think you'll see a growing number of other 4GW entities, such as gangs, adopting that model. Some have, at least to the degree, where they're an attractive alternative compared to a completely corrupt and incompetent state. That, again, is clearly the case in Lebanon, where the state is totally inept. Uh, but in the areas where Hezbollah operates, Hezbollah provides the services the state is supposed to provide and does not. We will see, and to some degree we already do see, car drug cartels, etc., cetera, um, adopting that model. That's a much bigger challenge than cartels that oppress the locals. The last bit of this question was, what are some examples of some good fourth generation warfare? 4GW well, forces that we can study, and I, I'm assuming good meaning morally. Well, I don't, I would, I would assume this question is meaning good meaning effective. I'm not, I'm not coming to mind, uh, I'm not thinking of any, what I would call morally good fourth generation elements, because they all represent a breakdown of the state, which means disorder and all of the things that flow with disorder. But I would point to Hezbollah again as, I might put it this way, a model fourth generation organization. <clears throat> it does not oppress the people. It provides services, again, that the state is supposed to provide and does not, including order. There is very definitely order in Hezbollah areas, even ISIS, which did oppress the people. Many of those people said at least they brought order. At least the common crime was greatly reduced. And the Taliban, of course, did this very effectively in the areas it held, and I think it still does it in the areas it holds in, in Afghanistan, um, where the crime that immediately explodes when the state disappears is suddenly brought under control. Uh, Hezbollah is militarily very effective, far more so than ISIS. Uh, the last time Hezbollah and Israel went at it, uh, it was a draw. And from the Israeli perspective, that was a disaster, that was a defeat. On the ground, it was a draw. So if you want to look at a model, I wouldn't use the word good, but if you want to look at a model fourth generation entity, it's Hezbollah. Excellent. Yeah, that's what I would say, too. Um, we got a couple more questions. These ones are from the live chat. Again, I highly encourage listeners to use the live chat so we can interact uh, in real time. And if you send questions or comments, uh, especially questions, I can read them, on, uh, I can read them live. Um, let me find it. Okay. How stable does Mr. Lind believe Saudi Arabia is short and long term? Um, I don't think it's stable either short or long term. Um, uh, whenever I read about MBS, I immediately think Shah of Iran. I think he is <clears throat> overturning longstanding traditions there, uh, one after another, as fast as he can. And I, I suspect below the surface, this is building tremendous resistance to him. And I think we're going to pick up the paper some morning and find he's been pushed through a heart. And mm -hmm. the Saudis, uh, in, in typical, in typical uh, Gulf Coast fashion, and um, that uh, Saudi Arabia is going even more Wahhabi, which is to say, Salafist, which is to say, ultra Puritan Islam than it was before. Uh, and the women are no longer driving, among other things. Uh, so, I, I don't think Saudi Arabia's I don't think Saudi Arabia's current situation is going to last terribly long, and I do not think that MBS's uh, efforts to uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the, the Crown Prince, his efforts to do the sort of forced draft modernization that was also the Shah of Iran's program is likely to succeed. I think that the backlash is, is going to come and it's going to hold on. We've got a question for the whole panel. Who do we think that the Democrats will run for president in 2020? Bill, you can go first. Oh, I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm not having a crystal ball on who they are 
likely to nominate. I'm trying to think of who do we, I most hope that they nominate. Uh, well, Pocahontas, of course, would be a great choice from our perspective, Elizabeth Warren, since she's obviously a, a, a phony of the first order as well as very far to the left. Um, but I think that um, they are most likely to, and I really hope they do this, find a, a, a black lesbian Muslim. That would be the <laughs> ideal combination. Uh, and, and preferably here illegally as well. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the forces within the party are going to drive things in that direction. If they're smart, they'll nominate somebody like the congressman from the Youngstown area here in Ohio, a uh, middle-aged uh, white guy in a suit, uh, who the previous time around led the opposition to uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, ran against her. Uh, that's the kind of candidate I think that they have a very good chance of winning. I hope they don't do that, and I don't think they're going to. I think the base is going to demand that they make the worst possible choice, and they'll find it. Yeah, I actually hope they they run out Hillary again in the wheelchair, just because 2016 was a lot of fun. That would also be an excellent choice from our perspective, but I don't think even the Democrats are yeah. that suicidal. Jeff, who do you think? Um, I I think there's going to be a another war like we saw between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton style. I think Bernie will run again, and I think he'll do well. And I think it'll be between him and Biden. But I think uh, I think Biden will end up being the nominee because I don't believe that the Democratic Party can feels that they can run someone that's as left as Bernie to win in a general election. So if they were smart and they had a chance against Trump, I think they would maybe run someone like Biden. But I still, I think it's going to be a very, very ugly primary. Just like, I mean, it, it would have been an ugly primary if they didn't have super delegates and get, you know, Hillary had it in the bag before, you know, the race even started, which pissed off a lot of progressives. So the, 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 the inner, the civil war in the democratic party is going to be in, in open display in this election. But I think, I think they'll run Biden. Jeff, I'm really surprised that you didn't pick your, favorite senator. Senator, senator Gillibrand? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know how much you like her from the forward to your book. Oh, I, I know. know. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I dedicated my book to her in a very satirical, over-the-top way for all the things she's done for the military to, you know, push cultural Marxism and to push the Meekie movement right down our throats. But, uh, yeah, she, but, she, tweeted, she tweeted a couple of weeks ago. She said, the future is female intersectional empowered by our belief in one another and even like liberals are like like really you're going there like all right <laughs> like all right that, that's what you that <laughs> uh that brings to mind that wonderful quote by my one of my favorite poets john dunn the 17th century anglican priest who wrote hope not for mine in woman they are at their best but money possessed <laughs> Anyway, um, I, I don't think that the Democrats are going to pick a white man or a white presenting man uh, like Bernie Sanders, even though he's, he's Jewish. All the, the, the non-white contingents of the Democratic Party only see him as white, not as a minority. Uh, I just, I think they'd be wise to pick somebody like Biden or Bernie Sanders, but I just don't think that they'll do it. I, I think that they'll have too much resistance. I think that they'll pick Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii. Yeah. She's, she's, she's anti-war. Anti yeah. She's a democratic socialist. She's not white and she's a woman. And I think she'd do pretty well. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good pick. I, don't, I didn't think about that. I think the obvious counter is very simple. We recognize that Hawaii's annexation was illegal and recognize its independence. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would be a Trumpian move. Well, yeah, I, I don't think he'll, I don't think he'd make too much progress on that, though, unfortunately. I, I think, I think. Throw it to the Supreme Court. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> But do you think, do you think, Brent, do you think Tulsi Gabbard is going to be able to, you know, she's going to have a fight on her hands with, you know, the, the new neoliberal warhawk 
side of the Democratic Party that has been fighting Trump at every step. So I, I don't know. I don't know that you could make it through a yeah. preliminary. The DNC has a money problem because nobody wants to be associated with donating, donating to, such a, to such a dumpster fire. So they have a money problem currently. It just depends on where that comes from. Soros has pulled a lot of money. Internationally, he's been a big donor um, for campaigns. Um, he's moved a lot of people across the, the country to vote multiple times in multiple states. So I guess it just comes down to who, where the money goes, who gets the money. I don't think the Democrats are buttoned down enough ideologically on a lot of those issues. Like, I, I think they have a lot of flexibility on war. And the left seems like they're, they'd be happy to relive the glory days of at least pretending to be anti-war. So, well, I was going to say, two weeks ago, I would agree, but they've pretty much taken the stance of being war hawks within the last couple of weeks. Because it suits them right now. Right. Well, right now it's because if if, uh, if Trump were to uh, bring about the second coming, uh, they would ally with the devil. Right. The, the anything that Trump does, even if it's something that the Democrats themselves have stood for for generations, suddenly they're opposed to. But more fundamentally, it comes back to what Jeff and I were talking about earlier: uh, the money. And uh, if they get elected on an anti-war platform, they won't govern on an anti-war basis because they will want to get on the same, they want to get their snouts into the same trough. I think I pulled out all the questions out of the chat. Um, I just want to thank everyone for participating and uh, talking to each other and sending questions and comments to us. That's, uh, that's good to see. Um, yeah, that's been awesome. <clears throat> so uh, I think that's about all we all the questions we have. Uh, Bill, why don't you plug your books since we didn't do that last week? Okay. Well, there are two books that uh, I've come out with fairly recently that relate directly to what a lot, a lot of what we talked about. The first is the Fourth Generation Warfare Handbook, uh, co-authored with Lieutenant Colonel uh, Greg Thiel, U.S. Marine Corps. And the other is my novel, Victoria, set 50 years in the future. That is fourth generation war in the United States. That's under the pen name Thomas Hobbes because it's an update of Hobbes' 17th century book, Leviathan. And it's also the story of how after this country breaks up, at least in part of it, we recover the old culture. And we do so through a movement called retroculture, simply reviving the old ways of living. And I'll have a book about that coming out first quarter of 2019. Jeff, go ahead and tell us about your book. Yes, yeah, so in my book, uh, American Cobra Pilot, a Marine Remembers a Dog and Pony Show. Uh, if you're a fan of satire, and uh, Brent earlier was talking about you know, the, the progress in Korea, if you want to know a, a, Mar a Marine Korean military exercise looks like which is actually a dog and pony show in practice um you read the book it's a fun read it's a quick read and if, if you're a fan of kurt vonnegut and satire you'll you'll enjoy the book it's funny but it makes a good point too and zoltzenitsyn like i said is my intro quote for the book and it sets the tone for the moral case i'm making about how everything is wrong with our military and our society jeff if you can show your book again uh with the cover up there i really like the cover uh, if you can get it on the camera out there, because it shows the two smartest Marines in the Corps. And I'll let people get a guess which is which. <laughs> definitely the hairier one for def definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so that wraps up our last show of 2018. Uh, we'll be back again probably next week, right? to start off 2019. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, if you have questions, comments, put them in the live chat. Uh, you can comment on any of our articles on traditionalright.com or send an email to traditionalright at gmail.com. We'll read it live and uh, we'll, we'll all have a good time. So thanks for listening, everyone, and we will see you next week. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.